So here's, um, welcome everybody. I'm Monty Anderson and I am a real estate developer practitioner in Southern Dallas County in Texas. I've been working with the city of South Bend now for nearly seven years. And with me today is Bernice Radel from Buffalo, New York there. And then Mike Keene, of course, you guys all know Mike Keene very well. And we make up what's called neighborhood evolution. And so what we do is we work with cities and small developers to create an ecosystem, and I like to call it a collaboration, where the business community, the city staff, and councils, and the whole community are working to build, uh, to build, uh, rebuild their cities. Because if it takes a village to raise a child, it takes a whole community to build or rebuild these buildings. And tonight we're going to be talking about um, uh, legal and accounting. You have to have it, and this may not be the that's always the sexiest thing, but we're going to try to give you some horror stories here in a minute to scare you, so you you know you've got to, you've got to do this. So, Town Maker uh, Group, this is what we're doing. We're step number four tonight, and um, we want to. We always like to review where we came from. You know, number one is find your farm, work it, commit to it, make it your life forever. And these things are numbered. These uh, slides are numbered for a reason. If you haven't done number one and number two. Get to know your neighbors because they've got to be the ones that occupy, energize, and support your spaces. If you haven't done number one and number two and number three, haven't found some money, some investors, some local banks are a good place to start. And if you haven't done those three things, you're probably stuck on whatever step or wherever you're at uh, in the process here. And I like to say that the number one step uh, and number two step, they create your luck. They create blessings. They create good fortune, karma, all of these things. When you commit to something for life, you commit to a place, you commit to a purpose, the universe seems to kind of get out of your way and give you the good things. And uh, that's what we do here at uh, Neighborhood Evolution. We, we talk about making money is really important and doing good is equal. Again, I'm going to say that again, making money. Dirty, is he is good. sharing. And doing good is equal. So... With that, what we're going to do tonight, and this is going to be really interactive. We're going to we're going to be uh, getting to Sharon in just a minute, but we're going to start off tonight with Mike and Bernice and I, and we're going to we're going to just start off with a little bit of um, like problems that we've had, or good. Maybe we can even we can maybe add in some good fortune, even um, of what's happened to us when we didn't when we didn't do the right things with with legal and accounting. Because both of them, if you don't, if you're, if you are not an attorney and you're practicing this business, in fact, if you are an attorney and you're practicing this business, you probably should have attorney even represent you. And that's what I would say. And even if you're doing a small deal, you should, because you can get in big trouble with a small deal. So what I'm going to start off with is I'll start first and then Bernice has got to come on and Mike's got to come on. We're going to tell you quick stories about things that have happened to us over the years. And so, uh, you know, I started off selling commercial real estate as a broker and so or an agent. I got my license, you know, and that's got all kinds of legal stuff in it. In fact, when we go to school these days, Sharon, I was thinking when we go to school these days, they, they said the number one problem that people have with contracts is that that blank in the back of a contract that says special provisions, additional provisions when when the buyer st seller starts writing their own language, they're like, we're going to leave all the ceiling fans or we're going to, we'll, we'll give you, we'll have 10 days to get out or, and there's not enough, that's practicing law. When you write in that paragraph back there and that's practicing law. And that's where most of the problems come from in real estate contracts and, and uh, lawsuits come from is, is that real estate agents, buyers, sellers, you know, writing in that, that, um, that paragraph back there. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, a, a, a project that I have, and, and I'm going to tell you about a like on a bigger scale, and then Bernice and them are going to tell you about some things that are smaller. Um, not, not that those are less important because they're not, but a few years ago, I got in partnership on a property called Main Station, which is in the background of my photo here with the uh, Duncanville Economic Development Corporation. They were my partner. They were, th this is a, a government entity, you know, that's my partner. So I've got a, a limited partnership at the back. At the time, we used to do what we call LTDs, limited partnerships, and we no longer do those, really. You can, 
and Sharon could answer some questions maybe about that in a minute, why we don't do those uh, as much anymore. But in that partnership with them, you know, I had certain responsibilities as the managing partner. So I'm the managing partner. I'm I'm handling the money. I'm doing all of those things um, that the property needs. I'm collecting the rent. I'm paying the bills. I'm doing uh, different things. And we had a, a city manager and a, a city government that was really friendly to me. And they were, and we really kind of got loose. We got loose with with crossing the T's and dotting the I's, just a little loose. You know, it's just kind of too casual because we were all friends. Well, what happened along the way is the city council, some bad city council people kicked out the good city council people that were friendly to me and they became very hostile. And they looked for anything they could find where the T's weren't crossed and the I's weren't dotted. And over basically some really minor things, no harm, no foul, no theft, no fraud, no nothing, over really the T's not being crossed and the I's not being dotted by myself, by, by my own actions and the city manager's actions that, that I negotiated with, we ended up in a lawsuit that was lasted two years. The lawsuit cost a million dollars. Now, it cost the city in, in the end a million dollars. Now, the city in the end really gave in and just paid all of my attorney's fees. My attorney's fees were like three, over $300,000. And at the time, I didn't have that kind of money. I had to sell assets. I had to do things. I had three, like, I think, Sharon, I think at that time, I had like three attorneys. Sharon doesn't do litigation. So I had to have litigators, you know, the, the attorneys that fight in court working for me. And it was over nothing over T's not being crossed and I's not being dotted. Wow. And, can I interject, Monty? Yes, can. Because part of the problem was that the city hired someone to audit the files. And so this person's job was to find anything and everything that may not have been done perfectly. Yeah, yep. And so, um, and I thought, no big deal. No, you know, but it, but there was enough there that they could actually make a big deal out of it. In the end, there was no, no, no foul, no. And they got, it took two years for them to get kicked out of office before we could, we could get, uh, this could get fixed. And in the end, I got my attorney's fees back, but I can tell you it, it aged me 10 years probably. And it really took, it really took a lot of life out of me. In fact, going into city hall these days in Duncanville, when I go in my body, my whole body gets weak. I, I get, I get goosebumps. I shake, you know, when I go in down there and I served on the city council just a couple of years ago, um, you know, for, for one, one term. And so what I want to say to you is especially when you get partners, um, when you deal with banks, when you deal with entities, you know, you prepare for the worst. Okay. You prepare for the worst. You prepare that a guy, somebody, a guy, a gal, a city, a city manager, whoever it might be, they're your best friends today. We're in the idealistic stage, right? But prepare that they won't be, that they will be a enemy one day. I didn't say hope for that. I got you. I got for that. You. I, got I said prepare you. for that. So that's my story. And we're going to move on quickly to Bernice's story. And then Mike's going to tell you a story. And then we'll, we'll then we'll come back and talk. Yeah, it's, it's funny. We When we were planning, hi, everyone. When we were planning for... Um, this I said, you know what, we should just tell a couple horror stories because it's not meant to make you run away, right? right. It's really meant to say, okay, I need to call an attorney and I need to make sure I have representation. And it's, I hope you don't get like freaked out, but you have to know that you need like insurance, you need an attorney, you need people around you. You know, it's like, if you're going to fight, you have to have a good army, you know? So, but anyway, my, my story, I'll be quick. Um, I um, started Buffalo of my business uh, with my, um, well, I started Buffalo really on my own. And then I had a boyfriend at the time um, who then turned into my husband briefly, um, was briefly my husband. So, um, and basically in a nutshell, we started, I started Buffalo of, I added him on, we got our first investors, all the stuff, like we bought some property. Um, and in fact, I, next to my office, I always have the day, the first few buildings that we bought, you know, for the first time ever kind of thing. I have that way here always, but anyway, um, so we sold the property, made some money, uh, 
had it actually we had an HGTV show for six episodes, which is a whole other conversation. Um, I think that I don't want to speak anything negatively about my ex-husband, but um, he decided that um, marriage wasn't for him and, and our business wasn't for him um, and just randomly took a disbursement from our account and went to the Philippines with it and decided that he didn't want to be with me anymore. So in the middle of getting a divorce and being left by my the guy that I'd be forever with, I also had buildings to manage, buildings to take care of renovations in process, like, like all the things, you know, and it was, this is where the legal comes in. We had signed an operating agreement for our business and the one paragraph, one sentence, one whole sentence said mm -hmm. both part, all parties have to agree to um, financial disbursements, essentially like some money uh, transactions, mm -hmm. essentially. And that one sentence was what allowed my litigation attorney to send his attorney one email that said, um, you know, if you don't give up the buildings and leave Bernice alone, you're basically going to be known as a thief, according to your own operating agreement. Okay. It was one mm -hmm. sentence, one sentence. And so I was able to get Buffalo, which we had trademarked all the buildings that we, um, that we had bought. It was like five or six buildings at the time, a couple of vacant lots, a big deal for me, of course. And, um, and I had to give him a little bit of money in exchange. We sort of worked it out. But um, in a nutshell, it was that one sentence in the operating agreement. Now, and remember, this is with my husband that I did that. I mean, that's saying a lot, right? I expected to go all the way to the end uh, with this guy, you know, and, um, and we didn't. We, it, it lasted six months, you know, so which was sad. I just do want to say on a very happy note, I'm happily married. <laughs> so I have a new husband. He's great. So, um, and we've been together for like eight years, but that's a good story because most people would say, oh, they're my husband. She's my sister. They're my friend. Uh, we, we don't, you know, we're fine. But the operating agreement was really key in that, in that argument, in that whole process. Can I, inter can I go ahead and interject now? Sure. Just in, <laughs> um, one of the um, advantages of having a lawyer is you, often people think of lawyers as being the, the naysayers, you know, we're the ones who are always say, oh, this is a problem, this is a problem. No, that's protection. It is protection because we're, because if you've got a good lawyer who's seen some things, they will be able to say, now, I know you all like each other right now, but what happens when you don't like each other? Okay. Yeah. And, and that is even with spouses, like it's, it's, it's always a little bit trickier with spouses. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, we, you know, I've had deals where people have gotten divorced um, uh, or, you know, someone dies. Um, and so, um, it, it, whenever you introduce another person into a transaction, you really do need a lawyer to help you think through some of these possibilities to think through some of what, some of the what ifs, and that's what a lawyer should bring. That's one of the things a good lawyer will bring to the table is, you know, <laughs> I know you're fine now, but what happens if, how do we resolve this issue? How do we resolve this trend, this problem? So yeah. Um, Bernice's point is well taken, which is even with a spouse, you're, sometimes some precautions are necessary. And, yeah. that's, and that's good for both parties, right? That's not just to protect, I mean, that protects both of you if you have an understanding, because that's the whole point of a partnership agreement. Um, believe it or not, is whatever is written in that partnership agreement, it's really designed to address what happens if you don't agree. What happens when one wants to do one thing and the other wants to do something else? You can always agree to do different than what the partnership agreement says, but but the partnership agreement is there for when you're not in agreement. So that's just a that's an important plug for why you need a partnership agreement of some kind when you have other partners. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much, Sharon. That's really great to have you there. And it's not even just on the spouse thing. You know, a lot of people like the, a lot of first deals that we see is like they get money from a family relative, an uncle or something. It's the same approach, same thing, you know, um, and people, oh, but they're my family. It'll be fine. And it's like, <laughs> mm, you know, so that's my little story. I'm <laughs> But that's an important, that's an important, it's an important kind of um, 
it's a cautionary tale, is that what they call it? Sure. Um, so, so keeping in mind that even if that can happen in a spousal situation, it can certainly happen in any other type of relationship. So I'm going to switch gears. Um, I could talk, uh, uh, they asked me for horror stories, so I've got a horror movie and it's got a sequel and a prequel. Uh, I could have talked about insurance. And so I'm just going to tell you, get make sure you got insurance because if you don't, that's another story. But mine is about accounting. And the, the funny part of it is my prequel is, is when I was just doing my own accounting, my, my uh, father-in-law is an international professor, renowned international professor of accounting um, at uh, University of Illinois. And uh, as a result, he always encouraged us to do our own taxes. Uh, well, finally, my taxes started to get a little more complex and I got busy. So I hired somebody to do a taxes for me and they actually saved me more uh, than what I was paying them to do. And you would have wow. thought that, that I would have learned from that, but I didn't. So when I got my first LLC and it was just me, Thrive Michiana, um, I thought, oh, this is no big deal. I'm not doing that much. And so I can take care of my own uh, checkbook. And at the end of the year, that person I had hired to do my personal taxes, well, I'll just give her all my files uh, and we'll be good to go. And I did that. And a couple of weeks after I dropped my files off, she called me up and tore me a new one because I hadn't done anything what was called a 1099. 1099 mm -hmm. is if you hire somebody for more than $600 uh, to do work for you, you've got to send them a tax form and also send it to the federal government. I didn't know about that. And as a result, I paid a few hundred dollars. That was the main show. Now, here comes the sequel. And this is a thing you would have thought I would have learned for those two episodes. So we form Hometown Development. Uh, and now I've got a couple of partners. And my one partner is pretty good with QuickBooks. And so he says, I'll be the accountant. I say, fine, I'll, I'll, I'll put together the receipts and I'll give them to you. And that worked for a few months. And then he was starting to get a bit overwhelmed. So he said, well, well, we'll let an accountant do that. And we hired an accountant to do that, but we didn't really interview the accountant to see what he could do or not. And so it comes to be tax time and we just don't get our tax stuff. And we don't get our tax stuff. And we don't get our tax stuff. And we finally get it at the very last minute um, and, and decide that we're not really satisfied with him. So I just say, I'm going back to my, my original tax person, Marge, who, who's been doing all my work for me. And so Marge starts to take a look at our taxes. She's taken over the accounting and she says, you know what, Mike, this is not right. We need to, you know, uh, 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 redo some things here. So can you get that previous accountant to send me the QuickBooks so that I can put all that in? And we asked him. He said, no, he's not sharing his QuickBooks. So good old Marge, fortunately, I kept the files. She and her team had to spend uh, uh, quite a bit of time putting in almost two years worth of information month by month by month uh, mm -hmm. to get all of our stuff in and then refile two years of taxes. That cost me five grand. Uh, and so, you know, if I just would have, started hiring her and it's not like a monthly accountant where you take your receipts and get monthly reports cost you that much to begin with if you're not putting in 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 a lot of information so let's, you know, for me i'm paying less than 100 bucks um now is you start to get more business coming through and more money coming through that goes up but guess what you can pay for it so that's kind of my my circumstance so the three things you really have to do is is start to talk with your insurance agent get one you trust get an accountant, get a lawyer. And the most important thing is talk to them and feel comfortable. If you're talking to a lawyer, an accountant or an insurance agent, and they make you feel dumb or like you can't ask a question, even what you think is a stupid question, find somebody else because they're there to tell us how to do things. I'm an idiot when it comes to this stuff. I need somebody who's going to listen to my questions and help mm -hmm. me. Uh, Thank you, Mike. Mike, 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 Mike. So that what he just said was a mouthful. Um, which is, <laughs> I can't, I, he, I just have to, I just underline bold face what he just said. If you don't feel comfortable with any of those three parties, you absolutely need to fire them and find you somebody else. Because, you know, I'm here to serve my client. I, my client is my customer. If I, if I, um, and usually, you know, when people kind of put you down and they make you feel stupid, it's usually they're a little bit too arrogant. It's probably their own insecurity. That's not who you want to help you. Amen. If, if you don't have, if Amen. you can't find a lawyer who can say to you, you know, I don't know anything about that. Let me see what I can find out. That's maybe not the person that you want because you, you want someone who will be honest, who will be real and who really has your back. And somebody who's looking out for their own ego is not the person who has your back. So if, if, if they aren't, 
if you don't feel comfortable picking up the phone to call them, if you feel like, oh no, I better not call them because they're going to be charging me and then I'm going to, that may not be the person that you need to hire and need to have retained to serve, you know, to, to help you with your, your business. That's right. So we're, we're here today to learn the legal and accounting, uh, learn about legal and accounting. And we said, get a damn good attorney and CPA, trust no one. Trust, and I, and I say trust no one except your attorney or CPA here. You know, I don't mean that people are bad or anything, and mm -hmm. I think you should be trusting, but business is tricky and people's situations change. Even somebody that's good, let's say somebody that you've known your whole life and they're good as gold and they've gotten in trouble with what I call the DDBI factor, death, divorce, bankruptcy, or insanity are always around the corner. <laughs> they've gotten in trouble and they don't tell you that. And so people will do things that they normally wouldn't do when they when they get desperate. So we're going to study how to how to do these transactions. And I, what I wanted to start with today was I put Sharon's bio up here and it's really long here because I wanted you to I want you to see it. And it's going to be where you can look at it later on. But Sharon is my attorney and she has been my attorney here in Texas for 25 years. We're friends. We're about the same age. Uh, we've grown up together in this business, but she started off with big firms, uh, big real estate firms dealing with big, you know, like oh, Comerica <laughs> Bank. She started off dealing with big, uh, you know, big uh, corporate uh, and nonprofit partnerships. She's represented, uh, you know, uh, community development corporations. She's represented banks. She's done, you know, all kinds of real estate contracts. She's looked at loan documents. She's highly qualified to do this work, maybe one of the best in, in Dallas, uh, in the Dallas area for sure. And today she, she's pretty choosy. I was lucky that she chose me to be one of her very few, her very few um, uh, customers, as she said a minute ago. And uh, so with that, I give you uh, Sharon Simmons, my friend and my, my attorney. So Sharon, we're going to, uh, and I'm, I flashed a picture up here of Sharon. It looks a little bit different there, Sharon. but. but <laughs> Sharon and my my CPA here, um, we communicate together. The three of us uh, communicate together all the time, every time we do a transaction. So anytime I buy or sell anything, there's a consequence to buying and selling. There's a consequence mm -hmm. legally, and there's a consequence a consequence accounting wise and tax wise. You know when you're closing a deal. And so my uh, accountant here, we've known each other uh, all these years. We're like, uh, it's like my board. Of, this is like my board of directors right here is what you see uh, in, in operating my company. I couldn't operate it with, without them. And um, so in addition to that, uh, bookkeeping, my, um, the guy in the glasses right there is, is our, our CFO or our master bookkeeper, if you will, the bean counter, the guy that, that uh, he's like an old curmudgeon. And that's why I put the cat in there with him give him some kind of life over there but he's a guy he's a guy that's that's that stays he, he's watching every dime he's watching he's he's in and if you're not if you don't have somebody doing bookkeeping for you that has to go to the accountant in other words you've got those receipts every day in your pocket they get lost in your car and your truck and they're not being de dealt with on a day-to-day -day basis then you're looking for trouble uh, down the road so with that um what we're going to do is we are going to now, Bernice and I are going to interview Sharon uh, with these questions here, which, which you guys have. You're going to have this sheet right here. This is a sheet that Mike uh, created. It's got lots of different uh, YouTube videos and things that you guys can look at later on. And I'm going to start with the first one, and then Bernice has got to uh, chime in. And then if you guys have a question on something, we're, we'll try not to stay too long on, on any one thing, but, but we'll stay long enough. Uh, if you guys have a question, and you want to ask something um, um, quickly, you can raise your hand, you can speak out, you can put something in the chat and we'll stop and, um, and go from there. So Sharon, I wanna first start off and I think you may have already said this, but you know, um, you know, uh, how do you hire an attorney and how would you recommend they hire an attorney? Also, Sharon, I would also like you to answer with this one. When would we go from doing work in like Monty Anderson personally to, um, to um, options real estate LLC. When when does that happen? So how, ask those uh, those two questions. I'd like to start off by asking you those two. So um, when you go from functioning solo to forming an entity, 
um, there's so many there for starters, this is a, this is something that you should have an attorney and talk through with your attorney. OK, um, generally speaking, you form an entity to uh, minimize your liability. So any type of entity, whether it's a corporation, not one that we typically use, an LLC or a limited partnership, most entities are going to protect you from personal liability. So if someone comes on your property and slips and falls, if it's owned in your name, they can sue you. If, it, if the entity, if the, the property is owned by an entity, they can sue the entity, but they can't get to you personally. So um, that's the main reason why we form entities to own property. Um, but there are costs incurred in forming an entity. And so that's why I say it's one that you discuss with your accountant and with your lawyer. Um, because to some degree, if you, if you own, like let's say it's a, a, a small property, you might be able to get adequate protection simply by having good insurance. So it's, it's, Everything that happens when you are doing um, a real estate tr transaction is, um, and what your and what your lawyer and your accountant help you do. What the accountant helps you save money by helping you do your taxes properly, by helping you manage your finances properly, minimizing your tax liability. Lawyers help you reduce your um, risk liability. Okay, so so that's why you need that team because they're focused on. I mean. As a lawyer, I can help you save some money, but I'm more concerned with your risk, okay? But in every transaction, you've got risk and you've got money and you're, you're always kind of balancing these things, right? And so there are, um, a good lawyer will help you assess the risk because sometimes it's appropriate to take on more risk. Sometimes when you've, as, as you've grown and you're bigger, you really want to think in terms of minimizing risk, but early on, you may be willing to take on a little bit more risk. So there are different things that you do with both your uh, lawyer and your accountant to, to make more money and to reduce your risk. And so that's why you need that team. So I can't really give you a black and white answer because it's going to be a function of your goals, your, both your short-term goals and your long-term goals. It's a function of what your resources are. You know, if you have a, a pretty good bank account, you might be willing to take on a little bit more risk than somebody else might. So why, why um, would we hire why would we hire a real estate attorney? Why can't we just hire somebody that does estate planning or divorces? I mean, why do we need a real estate attorney? I mean, why? I wish I could think of a good horror story for that. <laughs> be a short answer on that. Just give me so the so you know how your doctors are specialized, right? You know, right. you don't go to your um you don't go to to a, a gynecologist to have your colonoscopy done. Right. And women, we would never go to, you know, the guy who does the colonoscopy for you know, I'm probably getting way too personal now, but you know what I mean. Right. Yeah. You don't go. You're not going to go to a heart doctor for um, if, if you need brain surgery. Lawyers, believe it or not, the legal profession is that specialized as well. So if you come to me and ask me um, and say, oh, you know, I want to trademark this name. If I, I don't have, I've never done that before. I don't have a clue how to do that. Um, if you came to me and said, do this will for me. And if I did it for you, um, well, who knows what will happen when you die? Cause I not, I don't do wills. That's not what I do. So, so you, if you go to a litigator and you say, I'm doing this real estate deal. And this happens sometimes, by the way, <laughs> they'll act like they know what they're doing. Cause they've litigated a real estate matter here and there but they've never looked at title they've never, they've never looked, looked at title exactly they've never looked at title they've never looked at a title commitment they never looked at a survey so the legal profession is very specialized so what you want to hire is a lawyer who someone like me who spends all day every day just working for people like Monty okay Every day I'm reading real estate contracts. Every day I'm drafting con a, a contract. I'm drafting a partnership agreement. I'm looking at somebody's title commitment. Part of the reason for hiring someone who knows who's, who, who focuses on that is that it becomes more cost effective for you. So you might look at my billable rate and go, oh my gosh, that's too much. But I can do in 10 minutes what someone who's never done this before might take them an hour to do because I do it all the time. Very good point. That's a very good point. Yeah. Okay. 
so let's move on, uh, Bernice, let's move on. Let's skip number two. Let's just move on. to Yeah. The yeah. Yeah. So, you know, what is involved in writing an offer slash contract? Do you want to go into those kind of the broad brush, you know, on what's it like to write an offer? What What's in the contract for an offer? <laughs> so um, when it comes to like, so this is what I do typically with my clients, like Monty, who do real estate exclusively and they've done been doing it for years and years and years they will often do a letter of intent and i won't even look at it. i mean i won't see it till it's signed the key thing with the but, but if you're if you're not accustomed to doing um offers or letters of intent i would encourage you to have your lawyer help you with that the reason i say that is because with a letter of intent or an offer you don't want it to be binding you want it to be non-binding and so um by having it be and so 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 you know I have just like a couple of sentences that I'll give to a client to say, put this in there. That way it's non-binding. Okay. The only time you want something to be binding is when it's the actual contract. So offer letters, letters of intent, we don't want those to be binding. Okay. The signed contract, that will be when you actually have a binding agreement. Um, and I just want to make a comment because Monty had made made a comment about the additional provision section. Mm -hmm. um, I said this last time I spoke to the group, so let me see if I can re recall exactly how I put it. You know, lawyers, we think differently than you do, and we write differently than you do. Yeah, you do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so, and and so, and especially, and this is another reason why you want a, a real estate, a, someone who specializes in real estate, because believe it or not, I actually draft differently than a litigator drafts. Litigators are not quite, don't go for the precision that a good real estate attorney will go for, or, you know, in real estate, you know, because that's all I do is drafting and reading things and interpreting what the contract says. We tend to be a lot, a way more precise than a litigator. Litigators think in more general terms, you know, you screwed up, you know, you owe me this. Whereas we go through, you owe me this because in this amount calculated like this. Okay. So, so you, you, you may say, oh, this concept, because Monty does this all the time. Oh, we just, like he said, we just want ceiling fans. We'll put ceiling fans in for everybody. And the lawyer looks at that and goes, well, now, wait a minute. <laughs> Do you really mean every room? Um, how much are you going to pay for those ceiling fans? <laughs> um, um, are you expecting reimbursement? So we will look at it and ask all those kinds of questions. Hmm. Um, and, and so, 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 so that's why you need a lawyer when you're doing a contract, especially now printed forms serve a purpose. But by the way, even a printed form, there are a few printed forms that we use in Texas. Every one of them, I make changes depending upon whether I'm representing the buyer or the seller. Because most printed forms are, um, well, they're just, they need a little bit of tweaking, some more tweaking than others. So printed forms are great, but you still need a lawyer even when you're working with a printed form. Right. So you're saying, on. go ahead. No, no, man, that makes, I mean, and that makes sense. I think a lot of people, they look at the standard real estate contracts or whatever, but there's a reason why I know here in New York state, you have, have a attorney review period. You know, there's a reason why, even if a sales agent ma makes a sales contract, right. You, the attorney has to review that for you because of revisions and <laughs> things like that, right? And, and, there are, and they're, they're also, um, the printed form is designed to address a whole host of situations. Well, your situation may not be exactly what that printed form is addressing. You may have a, a tweak or, or something peculiar about your situation. So you need a lawyer who can help you adapt it to what your issue is. And often it doesn't take, I mean, with, with Monty, you know, we have some, we have, you know, we're selling some lots. And so for the most part, all these contracts are going to look the same. I'll still take a quick look at it just to make sure this is exactly appropriate for this particular lot with this particular buyer. Um, and it, you know, it takes five or 10 minutes, but um, that five or 10 minutes, sometimes I catch things and I'm like, wait a minute, this isn't, is this really what you meant? And it's like, oh no. So that happens all the time. Mm -hmm. So that's, uh, so a lot of times what'll happen with, with us when we'll present a printed form, you know, that's that promulgated form that you see that realtors use and things. 
So quite often what will happen is people say, oh, it's a standard form. You know, it's a, well, it, it's really not a standard form. It's commonly used, but I wouldn't say it's a standard, it's a standard form. There's still lots of legal. Mm, legal things that's so, a good point, Monty. Yeah. So what is um, number four here is what is, what is due diligence? And how, I mean, how, people ask me this all the time. How much time does it take? How much, so if I'm buying a property, how much time do I need for due diligence? I mean, you know, what is, what is due diligence? What does that mean? Mm -hmm. So due diligence um, typically is the time period that you're given under a contract to, to uh, what kick the wheels of the tire, check out the property fully. Um, and um, what in my experience, when, when I'm dealing with someone who's not used to doing, um, who's, who's maybe this is maybe their first, second, third, fourth, fifth property, I usually try to help them think through all the things they need to look for in terms of doing their due diligence. Somebody like Monty, I don't worry about it because he's been doing it for so long. He knows stuff to do that I wouldn't even think of. But that due diligence period is the time to make sure the title is what it's supposed to be, to make sure the construction is what it should be, to make sure there's no environmental issues, um, to look at the rents. If, they're, if, there's, if it's tenant-occupied building, you want to make sure you know what you need to know about all the tenants, about how much they're paying, um, uh, you, you're, you're revising your financial numbers because you're finding out information about the property. How long does it take? It takes as long as is, as is needed, right? So uh, if you, and it really depends upon, it depends upon both you and your experience, and it depends upon the type of property you're looking to buy. Um, or if you're selling, you know, um, you know, what kind of property is it? So um, I have, I have um, a client who specializes in multifamily and they may have, they may be selling or buying, you know, 300, 400 units. Well, believe it or not, um, the, the due diligence period on those contracts is often just 30 days. That's because, because the, the, the size of these properties, the people who are buying and selling these properties, they're doing this all the time. So they actually have a system. They can go through it really, really quickly and efficiently. If I'm talking to a client who's never bought a multifamily before, I'm going to say you might need 60 days because if you've not done it before, you need more time to process the information, to run it by someone who does know. So it, 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 the, how much time you need varies. Um, now, depending upon the market, you may find yourself having to move a lot quicker than you really need to or can. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes you may have no choice because you're, you know, you're competing for a property and, and, you know, the only way to get it is to have a shorter period of time. In that situation, I say you need to evaluate, are you really prepared to take that risk? Because it is risky, right? Mm -hmm. um, and you may be, but you, know, you need to evaluate, are you willing to take that risk? Um, and what I would also encourage you to do is before you sign the contract, make sure you've actually initiated um, various steps so that you can make the most of that time frame you have. Some of the danger that you've got to be careful of is say you may, let's say that you get a 15 days to, or let's say you get 30 days to inspection. That's what you've negotiated, uh, due diligence period you've negotiated. And then you call your environmental company up to do a phase one environmental mm -hmm. or an asbestos study. And they say, I can't get out there for five weeks. Yep. I can't get it done <laughs> for five weeks. And here you're, you're, here you're screwed, you know, right here, you're already, you're already so you've either got to find somebody to do it quicker or you've got to go back and, and retrade the deal with the with the with the seller or you've got to re, retrade and as we call that mm -hmm. retrading the deal so you're and people don't like to do that mm -mm. And stuff and, don't like to do it and that's why i say before you sign the contract you should have made contact with your environmental person so that you know you don't necessarily have to sign a contract with your environmental person but at least you've talked to them and you know before you even sign the contract what they're going to, you know, what they need. The same thing is true with surveyors, yeah. um, inspectors, um, you know, anybody, uh, anybody that you're going to, if, if, if you, if you, if you don't, if you have, if you don't have, I don't know, Monty, what would you say would be, and again, it varies depending upon your experience and depending upon, you know, the property. But if you've, if you're not accustomed to hiring people like this, then you definitely want to make sure you have talked to um, and interviewed multiple people before you even sign your contract. So you're prepared for, um, the, you don't have those kind of surprises. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I wanted, which leads us to number four, but before we get there, I wanted to make sure I said, 
The due diligence period um, is often where you find these big hiccups potentially. And, you know, you should, you know, it's kind of a scary moment, scary time. You have to be really on your game and have more of your team around you. Like they said, you know, you're, if you have to check for asbestos or lead or um, environmental issues or the title takes a long time or they don't have an updated you know, survey. So now you have to call. There's all these things that come in during the due diligence that's really important. Um, I have one kind of funny horror story that I think is worth mentioning because people don't think about it a lot. I often during due diligence, I will request proof. So people will give you a rent roll and they'll say, I get 900 a month, 800 a month, whatever. I actually requ request proof of payment uh, showing that the tenants are paying that 900 or that 800 that they say on the rent roll, because I've actually seen it where they lie on the, mm -hmm. on, on during, and then you don't find out and during, unless it's during due diligence. So um, it sounds really silly, but if the rent is 600 and they're lying and telling you it's 900, you, I mean, that's a huge number. It's a big so challenge. Two things, two things speaking, because I just saw someone say that all rent rolls are lies. Well, no, they shouldn't be. They should not <laughs> so, be. <laughs> number one is in your contract, you should ask for a certified rent roll. And a certified rent roll is one that says, um, you know, basically this, I, I am representing that this one's true and correct. Mm -hmm. And most contracts, um, and it, most contracts should provide that the representations that the seller makes, they have to stand behind. I mean, that, that is a reason that you can sue them if they're lying. Okay. Right, right. Now, now when I'm, um, you know, when, when Monty and Monty's selling a property, um, I try to make those represent, representations as few as possible, but there are some representations that it is appropriate and you need to, you, you should expect your seller to make. And one of them is, is that the information they provided you is true and correct, and especially a rent roll. So you want to ask for a certified rent roll. The second thing you can do is ask for tenant estoppels. What is this again, Ms. Sharon? Tenant estoppels, E-S-T-O-P-P-E-L-S. -E estoppels are very important. So if you're buying a property that, that is occupied, whether that's occupied with commercial retail tenants, one of the things you will want to get before closing are tenant, an estoppel from each tenant who occupies the space. Now, I'm going to have to qualify that because sometimes like if you've got a building, let's say you've got a ton of tenants, um, sometimes you can just get that from the, the most important tenants, the bigger tenants or the anchor tenants. Okay. Um, but what an estoppel does um, is it, an estoppel is a, is a statement that the tenant signs in which they say, this is the rent I pay. This is what my security deposit was. This is when my lease began. This is when it ends. I have this number of renewals left. And they also say, I'm, I don't think I'm in default and the landlord is not in default. They'll say, I don't have any claims against the landlord that keep me from paying my full rent. They'll say, I don't, I'm not, I don't have any rights to offset. So, what you're, so with an estoppel, what you're getting is, so first of all, you've got this rent roll that the seller has given you, which, you know, you want to verify that it is accurate. Now, even if they've sworn and they said, I swear it's accurate, you still, what, what did Monty say? Trust no one. You still want to verify that that's true. So that's why you get a, the, the, the tenant, a third party to say, yeah, this is correct. This is what I do. And so then you can match up the, the estoppel with the rent roll. And you know, there's, there's, there are lots of ways in which we try to, and I won't even get into all the details and the way we draft to protect a buyer when it comes to that. But you know, sometimes you can have the right to terminate if the tenant, if, if the tenant tells you things in that estoppel that, and, and the tenant can tell you something that will scare you too, right? If, but if the tenant tells you something in that estoppel that um, has you rethinking the deal, Usually what we write in the contract will we give you a right to terminate the contract based upon what is what is in a tenant estoppel. So if you if you're looking to acquire a property and there are retail or you know commercial tenants, um, put on your list to get an a tenant to tenant estoppels. And like I said, sometimes we negotiate whether if it's like let's say it's maybe a, a small strip center and you've got maybe six or seven tenants, 
you should get that um, estoppel from every single tenant because that's not a whole lot. And any one tenant could, I mean, that could screw up your deal. If it's a much bigger property, maybe you don't need it from everybody. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's just a process of negotiation with your seller. But if you have, if you've got a property, like if, if, if like what Bernice is saying, where you're buying a property and you've been told rent, to rent the rent is this, this, and this, you need to seriously consider having asking for a ten, asking the seller to get tenant estoppels for you. Mm -hmm. Okay, there you go. I just learned something because <laughs> I thought that for me the check was just fine. I'm like, all right, if this was well, the, this the, check, the check is not bad, but the problem <laughs> is the check doesn't tell you if the tenant. The tenant is pissed off because the, right. the, the AC hasn't been working and they right. may have paid you this this month, but next month they were planning to withhold their rent because the right. AC isn't working. Yeah, that's, they that's a, such they good a wisdom. Side deal. They made a side verbal deal. He told me I didn't have to pay rent this month because I couldn't work last week, but we don't have it in writing, you know, so oh, it's- dear. So Oh, that's an excellent point, Monty. That's, I have had, I have a client who acted like that, you know, who would, who would make all these side, who would make the side deal with people Mm -hmm. um yeah so the, the estoppel protects you from that as well because one of the other I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that money one of the other things that estoppel says is this is the only lease with the, with this is the only lease i have and here are the amendments there's no side right. deals. yeah yeah that's okay. great well so sharon so on the on just uh, to keep moving um one of these questions here number five is financing how long does it take and why is it important in a contract and i know you're not a bank but when it comes to that due diligence period and the conversations and planning around finance, um, anything that comes to your mind uh, in terms of timing and um, and whatnot? Um, I, I think I think number three in the the steps <laughs> was investors and mm -hmm. the bank, right? Mm -hmm. So um, that is one of those things that you should. Um, uh, be looking into usually, and Monty, you can correct me with this, but with most, certainly with most of my um, experienced clients, they know what the financing and who they're getting their financing from even before we're, we're signing the contract or in, while we're negotiating the contract, they're working through those details, maybe not getting a commitment letter, but they're in conversations with somebody. Mm -hmm. Financing can take, again, it's one of those things that can vary. So if you're working with a bank you've never worked with before, I would that's a question to ask. Here's one thing that I would always encourage you to do is to always ask the questions. And how much is it going to cost? How long is it going to take? Are always basic questions that anybody who's doing real estate, I mean, I expect if I ever talk to anybody, I always expect to get that question when somebody wants to hire me. Even my existing clients ask me the same thing. You know, how long is it going to take? How much do you think it's going to cost? So a bank, I would ask the same question to the bank. How long is it going to take? Because it can sometimes, it can be as short as a week. You know, I, you know what, let me, let me back up. There's this whole process that goes on before it even gets to the lawyer. And that's the underwriting. And, you know, I have no idea how long. What is underwriting? What is underwriting? Underwriting is all the work that the bank does to decide whether they're going to loan you money. So that will be them looking at your credit. That will be them looking at the property. That's them getting an appraisal, running that through all their um, all their departments. Um, and um, all once they've done all of that, then you get to that point where, OK, we're good to go. Here's your commitment letter. Or, or they've given you the commitment letter. And the commitment letter says, well, this assumes that the appraisal is going to be X, Y, and Z. Um, this assumes the environmental is going to be X, Y, and Z. So usually during this due diligence period, as you're doing the, the work for yourself to determine if this property is okay, the bank is also doing its due diligence. Yeah. yeah. So you, you know, the thing, the thing with these banks, and so the reason that step number three is before step number four and step number five. So you, you, once you get to know your bank, one of the questions when you, when you, when you interview your bank, you're going to say, how long does it take you to do a deal? How long does it take to get an appraisal done? How long does it take to get an environmental done? And I'm calculating, see, a lot of this stuff can go on all together. It can go on mm -hmm. all the same time. But if you write a contract, you got to be in the bank immediately, quickly. And the bank's going to always want to, they're always going to want, and we'll talk more about this, but they're always going to want the contract. They're always going to want your LLC or your LTD document or whatever they are. They're going to want those those basic things 
uh, and they're going to want those quickly. And we went through those a checklist last month. We went through that checklist. Y'all remember that checklist we went through? It's got all those things. You know, you got to have, you got all that out of the way. You got all your credit stuff out of the way so you can move quickly uh, when you when you go through these things. Now, there's another thing in the due diligence and the financing here that happens. You're spending money. Okay. Yes. You're spending money, <laughs> you're spending money that you won't get back if you don't close it on. So I spend money carefully as I go. I want to know that you've got the right to sell this property. You got good title. I can't tell you how many times we've done a contract with somebody and we started environmental and we started appraisals. And they don't, they're they got somebody in prison in South Texas oh, that's got to sign off on this too, a, a family member. So they don't even have the right to sign it. And here you've spent this money. So you get the title, you get your survey, then you got to go, okay, well, am I ready to get my environmental now? Am I ready to get my appraisal? So you we do them in order. We can talk more about that during our office hours or other things. But that way you've spent limited amounts of money, you know, as you get closer to closing. So, but there's certain things you gotta you gotta do quick. But so yeah, uh, I'm sorry that I laughed, but it is so true. Money is so on the money with that because you're spending money at, through this process. And a lot of people will spend money, for example, on architecture drawings before they, you know, sketch out a plan <laughs> or even ha have clean title and things like that. I have, we've all spent too much money in wrong at wrong places during due diligence. And it's, it's and one, of the, one, part. one of the things here to be particularly aware of in South Bend is some of us who have been going for tax sale properties, tax sale properties don't necessarily have clean titles. So if you're going to do anything mm -hmm. on it, you need to get the title uh, clean. What that means is uh, a clean title means that somebody has got a lien against it, but they can make a claim against that property, even if you have you have owned it. Um, there's also lots have been sold for relatively inexpensive amounts in our neighborhoods. Very often those have liens against them. And I know that a number of folks have thought this is a great lot and they snap the lot up before they've gone and figured out whether this is a case and that's getting ahead of yourself. And then all of a sudden you own a lot that you can't do anything with. So that is very important, particularly here. That, that actually brings up another um, possible partner in, and that's a title company. Um, you know, someone who, cause I know Monty has that kind of relationship with the title company where, you know, they'll run title on a property before, you know, it's even under contract. Now in Texas, technically they don't like to do that, but if you have a relationship with someone, they can do, they'll do it for you because you, you, you send them a ton of business. So that's someone else that, and in, in as you are going through this process of finding an accountant, finding a lawyer, I would actually put on that list finding a title company yeah. that you can work with as well. No doubt. Yeah. Because if you're, if you're doing title. what Mike is talking about, which is trying to buy, you know, tax sale properties, you really do need to have some understanding of what you're getting even before you, because you're, he, he's so right. You know, you can get a great price on something and then you can't do a cotton picking thing with it without spending a lot more money trying to clean up the, the title. Yeah, and, and we you, have some good title companies here. So if you ever want one, you just send me an email and I'll send it out to you folks in South Bend. Yeah, and title insurance for that matter. <laughs> so, all right, let's keep going because it's 7.30 and this goes till eight. I wanna make sure we get through all of this. Um, what else do we have on this list, Monty? We talked about entitlement. We talked about clean title, oddly enough. Yeah. But, but this one other thing about title, and this is this is another thing where people often you know, people buy houses all the time and they never use a lawyer. And I think people then think that, well, I can buy this commercial property and not use a lawyer. But, you know, title review, <clears throat> when you're reviewing, there are all kinds of things that show up in title. So first of all, is ownership, does, is the person who, who bought it, at, does the person who owned it actually own it? The person who says they own it, do they actually own it? Um, mm -hmm. You have issues of liens, like Mike alluded to. Liens can be things that are um, be judgment liens. They can be bank loans. Um, it can be um, IRS tax liens. Um, but the other thing are easements. Where are the easements located? Are yeah. they are they located in a place that's going to make it hard for you to to tear down and rebuild? Mm -hmm. um, or is or is the is a is a building built built across an easement which you're thinking well what it can't be a problem because this building's been there well it might be a problem you need to at least know about it so sometimes you also have covenants agreements between properties you need to know and those oh, show geez. up in title yeah. so 
Um, and, and, and let me just make this interjection. I did kind of refer to having a title company as part of your team. Keep in mind, though, that title companies do, are not your advocate. They are a service. They provide a service to you. They're not like on your board of directors. Your board of directors are the people who have your back. Mm -hmm. Title company is an insurance company. They have their own back. OK, their primary job is to protect the insurance company. That doesn't mean that they don't serve a purpose. It just means that don't expect them to find the title issues for you. Yeah. They're they're going to they're they're finding title issues to protect themselves, yeah. not to protect you. Okay. So, again, they can be part they a good title company can be part of your team. But please do not assume that that means that they are. I hate to put it like this, but they're not on your side. They're providing a service to you. That's okay. Right. That's right. Mm -hmm. Let's look. Let's look over here. We're going to skip the one about the real estate broker here. Maybe we'll come back to it unless Bernice, you might see something that we should do that. But let's let's go over here real quick to this this um this is the ten deal killers. Okay, and I I consider these these are the hardcore. And they made they they all end up being legally even the fire code mm -hmm. because you can't legally occupy something. But this is the deal killers, and I I put them up here, kind of in a way like title and survey first. I mean, I've seen people buy property that's not the property they bought. Mm -hmm. They didn't have a survey, and they had an address and it was the wrong address, and they thought they were buying a property with a house on it, and they bought a property without a house. OK, because they didn't they didn't look at the title in the survey. And, and then that just to interject. That's what that's what your lawyer does, because, you you know, you guys aren't looking at title and survey every day. But when someone sends me a title commitment, I always say, well, where's the survey? Because I can't do my review without both of those, because I'm looking to see, OK, is, does this match up? Is, is this what my client thinks? And, and that whole thing of what Monty says, you think you've got a house on it and you don't. I've had situations where I'm like, oh, there's supposed to be a house on this. <laughs> there's, there's supposed to be a building here. And there's not. So right. I think I just, we have people on this call who that has happened to. Yes. In fact. So, so, so this is why this that. is why this is why your lawyer needs to why you need a lawyer and your lawyer needs to understand what you're looking to do. And because the first thing I'll say is, what kind of property is this? What yeah. are we about to do with this property? Well, Let's go through these real quick and then we're going to come back and we're going to have your really open this up for, for, for conversation with Sharon, but the title survey utilities, just because, just because you're, you're buying a house that's connected, it's got a toilet setting in it. Doesn't mean that the utility lines are good. Right. It could be collapsed. The, the whole street could be collapsed. You know, just because you're buying a, a, a lot and there's a fire hydrant out in front of it doesn't mean it's got sewer. You could have a 12 inch sewer line. And the city says you can only hook up to the four inch and the four inches a mile down the road. Zoning? Yep. Big, yeah. big deal. Okay. No, no, can I? No, go ahead. I, I want oh, to. Let me go through them and then you can oh, come. Zoning, yeah. uh, accessibility, the ADA, if this is a commercial building or multi tenant building, you, there's different codes for wheelchair accessibility and what you've got to have. Environmental, this is anything that's contaminated in the property. And you got a lot of those kind of properties in, in South Bend that either have lead or they had an old gas station there before, or they've got asbestos and those kind of things. Building code, these are these are all things. You notice we don't have any pretty pictures on this sheet yet. We don't have any really pretty architecture plans. Okay. We got building code. Maybe this house has been condemned. You know, maybe there's no way you can you can rebuild it. Insurance mm -hmm. is a big deal today. Insurance is hard to get today. Yep. It's harder and harder every year. Financing, that's a deal killer, obviously. Fire code, one of the biggest deal killers out there, where they make you have a sprinkler system or not. So with that, then then uh, Bernice, go ahead and, and say what well, you're going to say. We can talk yeah, about Yeah, no, I just want to say the thing on zoning. So, you know, I think a lot of you know that I've, you know, spent eight years serving on the zoning board here in the city of Buffalo. But let me tell you how many people buy properties and don't realize that their property isn't zoned right or or they don't understand the zoning enough. So they buy a building, then they wanna put an auto garage in it and then they can't because they bought it and they just thought they could do anything with it and they can't. So really understand what your zoning, current zoning is and what you want to do with that building. Is it allowed? Can you put a pickles shop in it? 
Can you put a, I don't know, a dance studio in it? You know, you could have no dancing, like Footloose. I'm not saying South Bend has that actually, but South Bend's code's pretty cool. But that's important to know. Very, very important to know how we get that all the time, all the time. And uh, so anything, anything else at this point, uh, Sharon, will any, um, you know, even though these are not your attorneys not going to go out and do your due diligence for you, you know, uh, you know, the attorney's not going to comment really on the environmental that, you know, you may, your attorney may, uh, may say, do you have this, you know, checklist, mm -hmm. of these things, have you checked the building, your bank's going to want to know about most of this. You know, your bank's got to definitely want to know that you've got the right zoning in it. Look at this. I want to show you something real quick on the fire code right here. You see this? See this? This thing right here? This awful fire stand? You know what that cost? I have a little bitty building here. You know what that cost? $75,000. Oh, for heaven's sakes. That's the same standpipe system on a large building. Okay. Now, all I have is office and two apartments up here. We say, well, this is a cute little building with, you know, office downstairs and two apartments up front it shouldn't need any fire system like this it cost seventy five thousand dollars a day i had to put a vault out in the street and then insurance today is just gone wacky my mm -hmm. attorneys can both tell you uh right now insurance because of hurricanes you know uh snowstorms mm -hmm. uh, earthquakes tornadoes yeah. you know what happens in new orleans affects south bend and new york and texas mm -hmm. you know and so all of that these days insurance is extremely hard to get if yeah. you've got a bad roof on a building if you've got a bad roof you can't get insurance probably you know you're going to have a hard time so yeah and we learned this the last few weeks even me mike and monty learned that we that shopping insurance people sometimes can be helpful and because you you think you're getting quotes and then you find other people that can give better quotes. So it's, you know, you don't, you should settle on that. If you're getting, if you're getting no's or you're getting, you know, you should call other folks. And, and you need to make sure you have an insurance agent that knows how to deal with your type of building. Because what's happened is we got a crazy quote for my bakery building. You guys all know we're doing the ward building. And mm -hmm. uh, Bernice uh, had a person who's used to dealing with abandoned buildings. That the other insurance agents, I didn't. Mm -hmm. And she heard me complaining. She put me in contact with an agent. And within a week and a half, we saved ourselves uh, 20 plus thousand dollars because a guy who actually knew how to deal with this. So it's just like, you know, insurance agents, you know, you don't want an insurance agent that's used to doing um, home insurance only if you're trying to look at an abandoned building mm -hmm. and, and renovate it. Yeah. Okay, other questions for um, other questions for for sharing any other legal questions you guys got out there. I know there's a couple of chat. Um, One thing that I just want to comment on is that, you know, um, it, the importance of having this community and this network, I mean, that illustration was right on it, which is um, utilizing these resources um, to identify people who can help you. Um, this is a great, um, a great advantage to all of you that you have this, this group and, and these resources. You know, um, Bernice kind of made a comment early on when she was saying that the horror stories were not to discourage you. And I kind of wanted to piggyback on that, which is, um, you know, every, you, we all make mistakes, you know, we all, but that's how we learn. You know, the reason legal documents are as long as they are is because something happened and then someone says, oh, let me write to, to fix that problem. And, and that's the way we all learn. That's the way um, things evolve. And so I just hope that people would not be discouraged. Um, you're going to make some mistakes. It's going to cost you more money, but guess what? It won't happen the next time. But the beauty of this group is that you have, you can learn from the mistakes that other people have made and, and get the hookup, you know, for a good contact for this, a good contact tech for that. So I would just encourage you to utilize these re this resource of this group because um, making mistakes is part of doing real estate. And, and there are not a lot of developers who have access to a group like this where you can exchange information, where you can exchange resources, where you can exchange names. So um, don't get discouraged when you make a mistake. <laughs> uh, hang in there, um, but learn from your mistakes and learn from other people's mistakes as well. I call it tuition and we share our tuition by sharing our experiences with others.
our bridge. Yeah, Sharon, thank you so much. And, you know, I really have to emphasize like how, you know, I just think it's so helpful, if, you know, for you to be here and just to talk freely about, about these things. And is, are there, do we, Moni, do we have, we have time for questions, right? There's about 15 minutes. Yeah, Marty wanted yeah 15 to minutes for questions. Yeah. Anybody about either this or um, if, if we don't have any questions. Uh, oh, we have homework too, which yeah, is homework, right. Guess what your homework, I guess what homework is this this month? It's go go talk to a couple of attorneys and go find yourself an account, a like bookkeeper and a CPA. Go interview these people, find them. And um, you know, it's it's kind of loose, but you know, it's I hope you understand the importance of having these people in your life. Just like Sharon said, they're there to defend you and they're your army, they're your people, you know? Yeah. So um, your homework, are, you know, is to go out and interview, you know, who you can and share share the information who you've met, you know, with, with each other. We will be there May uh, 4th at 6th, right? So, you know, and, you know, it'd be great to hear what you've um, heard and learned from that point. Hey, uh, Paul oh. asked about who do we have for bookkeeping around and Paul, you know, uh, Bernice does this now and I'm getting ready to, but we're getting ready to, Bernice's bookkeeping is a virtual bookkeeper and there's mm -hmm. bookkeepers all over the country this morning that you can, I mean, you can get some really high quality people that are like, say, a, you know, somebody staying at home with kids, you know, that's really good at it, that doesn't mm -hmm. want to work full time and doesn't want to leave the house. In fact, my CFO bookkeeper here today told me he wants to work from home from now on, you know, he doesn't really want to come to the office anymore. So, you know, and that's, and if I want those kind of people, I have to do that. And so, you know, there's lots of opportunities out there. I know, Bernice, you want to come in on what you do on your, your bookkeeping. Yeah. Home. Like, so there's different levels of bookkeeping, but what you should do is go out and interview a few bookkeepers. Uh, you know, I would, I mean, I would start with Google and start with friends and just locally, um, and then you have to decide what works for you. You could have somebody local that can be part-time because, you know, like I need almost a team of bookkeeping, you know, at this point. I'm, and so I have local ones and I have some virtual folks helping and I have an admin assistant who literally uploads documents in every month, every mo uh, week so we can scan and pay bills and stuff. So it gets, it's more complicated, but for you, you should interview, think about virtual, check out, um, What's the website, the online website? It's not Indeed, but um, oh, it'll come to me. There's a website where you can hire bookkeepers virtually. Uh, that's really helpful. It'll come to, I'm sorry, I'm blanking on the name, but. Is but yeah, it Upwork, Denise? Upwork, yes, Upwork. Yes, yes, yes. Upwork can be helpful. You can find like a part-time mom or mm -hmm. whatever that wants to just do that. Um, but, you know, again, it's your comfort zone. Yeah. Um, anyone have any other legal questions or did, did yes. Paul's question earlier about, uh, sorry, Bar Barbara, um, there was a question earlier in the chat window about annual reserts. Paul, did you get that question answered? You can unmute yourself or, or repost. Yeah, it no, later. sorry, that, that wasn't a question. I, that was just talking about okay. uh, how much a pain in the butt fire systems can be. It's not just buying the system. I it's the see. Oh, oh, yeah. Well. Oh yeah, yeah no, I was just making commentary. Yeah, no. it's funny that you say that because I, I feel like I pay like a thousand dollars a year for annual checkups and everything for the system. It's not a thousand, but it's a lot on one of our yeah, it makes sense. Sure. I Barbara. actually have one question Barbara. that Barbara's got a question. Sharon. Okay. Oh, go ahead. Sharon. Yeah, Barbara, no, Barbara, Barbara, Barbara first and then, Bar and then oh, okay. Go Barbara. Go Barbara. Yeah. Sorry, Barbara. Hi, thanks. Hi, Sharon. Hi. This question is for you. Uh, is there any special thing I should look out for with buying a property that's under a reverse mortgage? Uh, I don't know. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I have not dealt with uh, reverse mortgages. I don't do anything that's residential at all. Um, okay. Yeah, so sorry. Okay, thanks. That's all right, Barbara. We'll find you someone else who can give you that answer, right? Okay, all That's right. Yeah, or if anyone on this call knows, uh, uh, feel free I can to tell you. Up. I can tell you a little bit about it. I mean, Barbara, what you let me tell you what you want to do is you want to get that document and you want to get it to your attorney. Okay, <laughs> okay. That that somebody that's done that kind of work can look at it, and then you want to probably talk and, and get the right from the seller to be able to talk to that mortgage, that reverse mortgage holder. So you can get all the details of that because there are some big penalties and other things that can happen if you're buying that use. If they're not, you know, they can be, you know, they can be bad. 
So mm -hmm. you just want to be aware of those things. I know some people that have gotten into them and then it's really hurt, hurt that they couldn't really sell the thing and they needed money and they mm -hmm. couldn't, they were really upside down. Mm -hmm. They couldn't sell their property and uh, they couldn't get uh, good information. And they, their reverse mortgage holder was Bank of America. So it was, oh, it was not oh, a wow. night okay. deal. So it was right. really tough. Yeah. So he's what, actually gave me a copy of his balance statement and everything. So he's not uh, upside down at all. He got good equity in it, but he's ready to move on and just let it go. So. But the question is whether he can sell it. That's the problem with those yeah. reverse mortgages. So okay. that's what you need to pay attention to. There's penalties. There's okay. Penalties. There can be big penalties for selling don't it. Penalties for selling it. Okay. No. And you may not care. He may not. You may not care about that. But but what could happen mm -hmm. if you're going to get to the closing, and then he's going to have this big penalty that he didn't know about all of a sudden, and he's not gotcha. going to want to go closing. So. Gotcha. Hear you. Okay. Thank you. I knew I better ask somebody. <laughs> And Bernice, I think you had a question for yeah, Sharon. Yeah, I, I had a question that really hasn't come up, but I, I want to um, ask Sharon. Um, well, I remember when I first started, people would, you know, I was looking for a lease document for residential and commercial leases. And I had pulled it from like the internet and my attorney like had called, I, I kind of briefly mentioned it, went to my attorney and he was so mad. He was like, really, Bernice, you should know better call me. And so I just wanted to ask you, you know, what your thoughts are on like the leasing, having a good lease, um, you know, that, that works, works for people. Because a lot of people here have mixed use buildings. So they have storefronts and apartments mm -hmm. or, or, you know, some just apartments, but there's a lot of mixed use buildings. Any thoughts? Um, don't do, don't draft your own lease. <laughs> uh, <laughs> don't use Google for your lease. <laughs> um, Definitely, uh, there are some printed form leases that are acceptable, um, but I really think, especially with mixed use, you need that you, you just you have to talk to your lawyer about it, and you have to get your lawyer to either prepare the lease or prepare an addendum if it's a printed form lease. Mm -hmm. um, but you don't um, leases even more so than contracts, although I'm not trying to say, I mean, even with contracts is important, but leases even more so because um, leases can be in, in play for a year to five years or longer. And so the wording and the language in a lease is just even more critical than what than in a contract because it's going to be out there and you don't typically, you know, if you're the landlord, you don't get out of it. You're not able to get out of it. So it, it's not something to fool around with. So, so uh, you just you just have to use your lawyer. You know, I, that's every, probably, every, that's every probably too general, but. Mm -hmm. Every state also has certain requirements sometimes. So there's certain uh, uh, mm -hmm. set of uh, uh, phrases that need to be put into an Indiana lease. And then there's certain ones that are being put into other state leases that, that can't be put in the end lease. I recently got a, a lease started together from the building we're working with. But what I did is I got a good example and then I gave it to my real estate attorney because it had the things I wanted in there. And mm -hmm. then that person worked with us to sort of make sure it fit what we needed and what the state of Indiana required. You know, Monty made the comment earlier about contracts that, that you know, people say there's it's a standard form. There's not really such a thing. That is especially true with leases. You know, you even if it's a, promulgated form, um, just don't assume that, oh, look, it looks, it looks official. Don't assume that that means, that means it's okay. You really need to have a lawyer look at it. You know, and, these and days, what you can do is you can have your lawyer prepare a form, right? And then, and then you can, so can I have clients who do that? They use, they have a form that we've worked on. And so they use that regularly. If something comes up, that's going to be different than what is in the, you know, somebody, if you have a tenant that wants to negotiate, then they'll pull, they'll bring me into the mix. But, you know, it, it's worth the investment to work with your lawyer to come up with the form lease that you will use given what type of property it is. Mm -hmm. But um, don't fool around with leases, get, get the, get legal help. So these days, these days, I know more, you know, maybe I know more than I ever did. I should know more than I ever had before. And I now send nearly every lease to Sharon for review. And I do a lot of leases, like a lot of deals, you know, every week. And I send, and especially quite often these days, what will happen is 
somebody will say, I need to get out of my lease. How can I do that? Well, you can't get out of your lease, but here's what I'll do. I'll terminate your lease once I get another tenant in here, but I want you to forfeit your deposit and I want you to pay me commissions and I want this or this or this. So a lot of those now we send, I used to just draft them myself, you know, and then I would read them three months later and I can't tell you what I think I meant. <laughs> I, can't, I honestly can't tell you. I read what I read, wrote myself and go, what in the heck was I talking about? So especially those weird things mm -hmm. like you got, you know, you got to forfeit your deposit. You got to pay me commissions. Well, how much commissions? Well, when is it due? How do I, do I got to get out now? And, and then how do I terminate the lease when, you know, how do I actually end the lease when I find a new tenant? So they're no longer obligated. How do I mean, all of these weird little things that come up mm -hmm. and it's just a lot easier. And when you get an attorney here, okay, if you're going to hire an attorney and I have this in the homework up here to, to, to look at here, but I want you to this week to, if you don't have an attorney, identify three local counselors of law. And I put this in here, counselors of law. It's another word for attorney. I looked it up in the dictionary, a counselor of law. Sharon is my counselor. She actually counsels me on a lot more than law, believe it or not. But she she is my counselor of law in, in everything. And I, I so I want you to to um, to interview, identify three and interview them. You can interview them over the phone. If you have an attorney, make sure they do the things that you need to perform your business. And if you make a decision to hire an attorney, you're going to need an engagement letter. Get ready to go. If you are negotiating a contract, a deal, and you don't have your attorney on board, you've waited too long. You have to have them on board. Get, an, get a letter agreement, your engagement letter. And the law, the law firm that you hire will have to do a conflict check, they call it. And that's to see if they've ever represented someone against you or one okay. of your organizations. And they have to do this before before you can you can hire them and then do the same thing with cpas and bookkeepers sometimes a cpa firm might do bookkeeping they might do both okay but quite often my cpa does not do bookkeeping okay my cpa just wants to do the the easy stuff the tax returns and advising me on tax does not want to do that day-to-day -day bookkeeping yeah. so you might be able to find a bookkeeper uh, that can do this work virtually and we've already said that already so um you know those are those are the homework for the week and you've got this i think marty's gonna will we'll share this with you i will um, i will do we, will. Have, do we have any more last minute questions burning desires anything any problems something else if it's not legal uh, anything that anybody's got i want to make sure I, we're not holding somebody up let's say that one of you out there today is is ready for you know you're past this You've already done all this stuff. You've got something down the road that you're waiting for the next step to get here. We don't want you to wait. Okay, if you've got a problem with steps five, six, seven, eight, nine, or 10, or somewhere else, we want you to, to tell us about it. We wanna help you where you're at, um, but we also want to encourage you to follow these steps at the same time. And the, the, good, the good news is, and, and Monty referenced this earlier in the call, on May 4th, which is a Thursday, Monty and Bernice sadly not Sharon, but Monty and Bernice are com are coming to South Bend and we are going to have a little happy hour with them at the Howard Park Public House um, from 4 to 7 p.m. on May 4th. So mark that in your calendars. It's a great chance. It'd be sort of a casual setting, but we'll sort of meet and greet and talk. Uh, we're going to invite a bunch of bankers and, and architects and lawyers to that uh, session as well and just a chance for us to meet one another and sort of build out that larger ecosystem which is so important so critical to proper development mm -hmm. um and then following that up in the morning of may 6th which is a saturday morning here in town at the charles martin youth center um we're going to run a workshop um with monty and bernice and uh and i'm sorry mike I, i'm leaving you out here but uh with mike keen and um and a couple of uh, folks from the world of finance. And we're gonna dig really deeply into how the finances of these deals work, but with some really practical examples. And uh, Monty, do you wanna to speak to that for a quick second? Yeah, uh, yeah, we're gonna, we're, we've really we've really worked to, to um, make performance and those kind of things easier. We've worked to, for you to, to learn. We've also, we've got um, some charts we show you on putting together partnerships 
those kind of things that we're going to really dig, dig down deep into. We're also going to talk about what's the what's the consequences of 8% interest right now. What does that do to your debt service coverage? I mean, what are banks doing? You know, what are, I mean, I had a bank quote me 10 and a quarter percent interest the other day, 10 and a quarter. My, my last loan, uh, Sharon on Wheatland Plaza was 4.75. I went, I went from in the year 4.75% interest to 10 and a quarter. Wow. What, what does that do? What does that do? We're going to talk about that. Uh, we'll talk more about how we got to split these properties up. Um, Bernice, you know, I mean, Bernice has been splitting some of, I mean, you know, how, do you, how do you make these numbers work? Mike is doing the, the same thing. And I, I want to make sure you guys out there know that Mike is being more quiet today because Mike is already a staple in the community yeah. here and, and Mike is traveling with uh, Bernice and I now to oh, other wow. cities. And Jim Kuman to Jim. I think it's okay. Jim. Is here Jim Kuman. Jim, uh, yeah, Jim's with us too. Raising babies uh, lately, and less less. Right. Uh, <laughs> Jim is here. And uh, this thing on May sixth. This is a really great chance. We're going to be in person, live and in person for mm -hmm. three hours on Saturday morning. It's going to be a, a lot of fabulous content hey. and a great chance to. Sit down with Monty and Bernice uh, in Great. person and talk talk through projects, talk through deals, talk through challenges. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's and also really make time to make time to come to those happy hours because you can learn a lot. But yeah, um, one of the most important things that's going to happen is these conversations you're having with the people coming because these are the people you need to be able to work with. Uh, and so this is a great opportunity to build your own uh, your start to build your own connections. And then, uh, you know, there's also uh, the 12 steps group support group, which Mike is uh, championed up there. Uh, that's that's an ongoing group. We have now groups going in Dallas, Texas. We have them starting in Austin, Texas, in Kansas City, uh, soon to be in Buffalo. And Lafayette, South, Louisiana. Lafayette, uh, mm -hmm. Louisiana. And uh, so we have these groups that are going in. And it's an amazing thing. And maybe you're Maybe you're a sophisticated developer and you don't need these basics. Well, we need you here. You need, so this is a, a, our whole philosophy is paying this forward, you that know, helping other people and helping others. And, you know, so you, you're responsible to come and help your community. The more, you know, as they say, as the tide rises, so do all ships. All right now. Wanna, <laughs> and I see um, our... Uh, uh, Lori on our team posted the two graphics for the upcoming events in the chat window. So the networking event on May 4th and the workshop on May 6th. So those are in the chat window. So if you want to see those or download those or mm -hmm. uh, see the dates, say the dates on those. One thing we missed that should be said is we're working on, it won't just be us speaking. There's going to be, um, we're going to have a couple yeah. bankers, a couple people in finance as well on Saturday morning. So, um, you know, it's not just going to be us. It's going to be a combination of things. And we're working on a getting a local banker. Um, that's TBD. We're working on that right now. And a couple other banking uh, folks, so you, we can talk to you about money. So it's not just like here's a pro forma, here's investors, here's money, and then also here's like the banks that are, that are interested. And, and you, so the, it'll be very open, very able to be asking a lot of questions. One or two last things. I want to uh, first. I want a, a shout out to Barbara Turner. Okay, because in May, at the end of May, the Strong Towns National Gathering and the Congress for the New Urbanism have their annual events every year. And South Bend is being featured, okay, yeah. on a panel here that Barbara Turner, your own Barbara Turner and Mike Keene uh, will join uh, Bernice Radel and I as in a panel to discuss all of the great things that are happening in South Bend. And it's, uh, it's a very special, we appreciate Barbara being willing to travel to Charlotte, North Carolina at the end of May to be on stage with us and uh, to really show how great um, South Bend is doing right now. And then uh, last I want to say this is that uh, Sharon is, you know, I've been through six uh, financial crises in my career, six, you know, starting with the savings and loan debacle out of the 80s, the oil crisis, the superconductor, super clatter leaving uh, Texas, 9-11 uh, uh, when it happened, 2008 mortgage crisis. Uh, let's see what else. Um, now wow. COVID, and then now inflation, and now in between, I had my own numbskull things I did. Okay, <laughs> to create some more crisis. One of them was a divorce with my partner of many years. Uh, was a divorce, 
that uh, Sharon, and, and, and because I had good counsel here and a good CPA all these years, I've never had a foreclosure and never had a bankruptcy. I was able to maneuver and get through these tricky things. They were not fun. I'll tell you, I spent a lot of nights away, but I just, and I want to really encourage you, each of you, to surround yourselves with the right people. It'll help raise your self-esteem and you'll have more confidence.